Hey Trailblazers and Tarmac Tacklers, welcome back to the Maximum Mileage Running Podcast and I'm on my own today and I am here uh, in terms of I'm on my own, I'm not with my co-host Faye, she's got other things on today but I am here with a guest uh, that I'm delighted to have on because I have his book, I have it right next to me, Um, it's a book I've read a few times and I follow many of the principles in it. Um, and I managed to pick up this uh, this wonderful man who's written this wonderful book, uh, just chatting on on a Facebook group. And uh, I'm delighted to say that I've got Richard Blagrove on. Uh, Rich, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too, Nick. And thanks very much for the invitation to come on. Yeah, no worries. As I say, I uh, I think we ended up uh, commenting on somebody uh, saying something on a. Uh, on a Facebook group, and uh, and I thought, Do you know what, Richard would be a great guest to have on uh, on on the show. So, um, why don't you tell us, Rich, a little bit about yourself and um, and and what you do? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, try not to bore you too much with an entire biography here. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the interesting thing for listeners is I, I originally come from a running background, so. I was a runner during my teenage years, and whilst I was at um, at university, I was a, I was a competitive eight hundred and fifteen hundred meter runner. Um, didn't ever compete at kind of international level, but I guess I was a sort of reasonable national level standard. Um, and I kind of got into strength and conditioning actually because of the injuries that I had as a runner, and started to become quite naturally interested in whether. Um, like strength-based exercise could offset the risk of of injuries and help prevent some of the injuries that I was getting. Um, and then I actually switched sports and did rowing for four years. And because I'm quite tall, I was sort of naturally better at that, but uh, always enjoyed running a little bit more. So ever since I, I stopped rowing, um, I've just been a recreational runner. So I tried to get to a, a park run every Saturday and try to get out the door three or four times a week if I can for, for 10K or so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of my academic background, I've been working at universities now since 2008. Um, and initially, I was still a strength and conditioning coach alongside all of, my, all of my academic responsibilities. And because I was based down at St. Mary's in London initially, um, listeners will probably know about the kind of running community and an environment around Bushy Park and the mm-hmm. Twickenham area. Yeah, that's where the um, started, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um I was kind of naturally starting to work a lot with um, with middle and long distance runners down in that area and sort of, yeah, I guess developed a bit of a reputation for becoming a, a sort of specialist strength and conditioning coach for, for runners. Um, and then, yeah, I moved up to the Midlands in 2017 and worked at a university in Birmingham for, for two years and then started a role as, as a lecturer in physiology at Loughborough University in, in 2019. And yeah, I guess the last sort of five, six years have been much more focused around research into running physiology and the use of strength training with runners. And that's kind of extended out into um, illness and injury with runners as well now. Mm. Okay, interesting stuff. The ever, ever going battle with uh, with illness and injury. Um, yes, yeah. It, it's, it's, I mean, one of the questions I've got for you is, um it is does strength and conditioning i'm going to use the word does strength and conditioning stop injury because i'm always really careful to use the word stop you get yeah injured. stop or prevent is uh is not ne- never good words to use <laughs> yeah yeah it, and you see it so much i mean the amount of um you know coaches and you see it in runners world magazine and things you know do this routine and you know you'll stop injury just doesn't yeah. happen, right? Yeah, and I've kind of, I mean, just with the that basic terminology, like I've kind of got a full circle with it that I think um, that's what I used to say, like we're trying to prevent injury. And mm. then the kind of academics and researchers weighed in and they're like, oh, you can't prevent injury. You can only reduce risk or kind of mitigate the likelihood that you're going to suffer an overuse injury. But I've kind of, yeah, I've gone full circle in that. I, I don't mind people saying, like strength and conditioning is designed to prevent or stop injury because ultimately that's what we want to try to do. Like yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of where we want to try to get to. Um, like it's, um, it might not be completely realistic to prevent and stop injuries forever for the rest of our running career, but uh, that's ultimately what we want. So 
it's I don't think it's too bad using that sort of terminology. Um, but yeah, I mean, to an- answer your question, I think um, like we've done a couple of surveys with quite large cohorts of runners and the most popular reason for runners engaging with strength and conditioning activities is this belief that they're they're going to prevent or reduce the risk of getting injured like above and beyond the performance improvements that we know that it offers Mm. so i think the kind of anecdotal and circumstantial type evidence that we've got when you speak to runners and their coaches is that yeah we definitely can reduce the risk of of runners suffering overuse injuries um with my kind of like research academic hat on we've, we've actually got a paper under review at the moment actually which has gathered together all of the research studies that have looked at strength and conditioning interventions um and applied those applied that to a runner and then compared it to a group that don't do that strength and conditioning intervention and had a look at how many injuries both groups have got over quite a long period of time um and most of that research would suggest that there isn't like a clear benefit of doing strength and conditioning. Surprisingly, I thought you were going to say that, and it's yeah, yeah, it's 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 so interesting that because I, when I when I give strength and conditioning to my runners, and I'm quite staunch about this being part of my coaching methodology, is that yes, I will say to people, you know, we want it to, like you say, you know, hopefully prevent some injury, um, but unfortunately, injury is part and parcel of running because it's such a high impact. Yes. You know, yeah. Sport that repetitive, you know, you go and do a marathon, you've hit the ground, you know, pretty much 40,000 times with two to eight times your body weight um, go, yeah. going through your legs. But really, I use it as a performance enhancement. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, as I say, that I think the jury's very much still out on the kind of scientific evidence around whether strength and conditioning activities will offset the risk of injury. But as you just alluded to, we've we've got much clearer evidence that strength training, especially, um, will enhance performance, and that seems to be via improvements in running economy. Mm-hmm. So, could, could you talk a bit more to that? Because it's, um, I mean, uh, again, that was one of my questions: is how does strength and conditioning improve running performance? Yeah, sure. And I try to I try and avoid getting too physiological here, but. Um, like we, we know both middle and long distance running performance are, are mostly limited by physiological attributes. And when I say physiological attributes, I mean things like VO2 max, mm-hmm. like the speed at different metabolic thresholds. So I think listeners would have heard of like your lactic threshold or uh, maximal metabolic steady state, like the higher, the higher the speeds of those two thresholds, the faster and more sustainable you can run for longer. And there's also a third called running economy, which is essentially the amount of energy that we're using to run at a sub-maximal intensity. And obviously the less energy or oxygen that we can use for the same speed, the longer we can keep it going for and the less fatigue that we get. Um, And the interesting thing for me as a strength and conditioning coach is we know that VO2 max and those metabolic thresholds, are they're mostly improved via running and so you've got to do interval training and long slow distance like higher volume work to improve those things yeah but running economy is affected by a whole bunch of different systems within the body including our biomechanics so our kind of running style and technique um and then neuromuscular factors and neuromuscular factors such as the way the muscle behaves the way tendons behave the types of muscle fibers that we're activating and the way we're producing force when our foot's on the ground, um, can be heavily influenced by different strength training activities. And so if we can improve some of those, we seem to get this improvement in running economy after engaging with strength training for a few months that then improves our running performance. Um, I think the other other factor just really quickly to mention is particularly for middle distance runners and higher level runners that are potentially involved in like a sprint finish at the end of a race. Mm-hmm. We also know that strength training is quite good at improving maximal sprint speed. And so for an 800 meter runner, or if, yeah, if people are going to be challenging for first place at the, or a medal at the end of a race, like they, they need to be pretty fast. Um, and so, yeah, improving maximal sprint speed will, is also beneficial for runners. That's why you see, I mean, okay, this is talking about sprinters over, you know, 100, 200, 400, I mean, particularly 100 meter yes. sprinters. I mean, they look like bodybuilders nowadays. Yeah, yeah, some, some of them do. But uh, 
yeah, I, I guess it's a bit more obvious that they would engage with with strength training activities, but um, the, yeah. the types of things that they would do wouldn't be too dissimilar to what a middle and long distance runner would do. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about some of those things. So, yeah, sure. One of the things that sort of gripes me a little bit is um, is the whole uh, like body weight. You know, can I do body weight exercises to improve my strength? Mm. And in my mind, yes, you can, but only to a very limited point, and usually in the context of uh, rehab from uh, from an injury. Yeah, in the early days of a, of a rehab program, um, you know, is it sort of right to say that body weight isn't useless, but really we need to be lifting against some sort of resistance to? you enact the adaptations that we're looking for to get those things, you know, those benefits that you talked about just now, you know, running economy, et cetera. Yeah. You know, what are your yeah. thoughts on all that? I think, I think you summarized it really well there in that if you've got a runner who hasn't engaged with any form of strength work before, like just moving against their own body weight is probably going to provide enough overload for the first month or two um, of a new program. And so if they do an exercise like a glute bridge or standing on the spot, just doing a, a, a kind of body weight squat, um, like they might still get a little bit of soreness and like a sufficient amount of muscle activation to promote some strength gains in, in those first few weeks. Um, but then as you were kind of alluding to quite quickly, we obviously like just the basic training principle of progressive overload, like we need to start overloading the exercise and try to target the neuromuscular system um, in order to get further gains in strength. Um, and so the best way to do that is obviously to start building up intensity rather than increase the number of repetitions that we're doing. And so the intensity on those exercises is obviously related to the amount of, of load that we're lifting. Um, and so, yeah, you can still use the same sorts of movement patterns and exercises, but applying some external load in the form of resistance is going to be really important just after those first few weeks. Um, I mean, all that said, it it does depend a little bit on which exercise that we're talking about as well, because if we take an exercise like a single leg squat, like even for somebody that's been engaged with resistance training for quite a long time and is, has got pretty strong legs, like a single leg squat is still quite a decent strength challenge for them. And so there are ways that you can overload just using body weight if you haven't got access to a gym or, or the, the equipment in a home-based environment. How would you do that? Is it, you know, I'm going to use a technical term, um, time under tension? Is that one way of potentially doing that? Um, what with this, sorry, with these? The so, like a single, so, so like a single leg squat. So let's say, you know, I'm I'm, I'm fairly strong. Yeah. I, you know, I can squat 100, 120 kilos, um, but put me on a single leg squat, give me two five kilo dumbbells and I feel yeah. sick after six, <laughs> uh, six reps. Um yeah, it's it's yeah, not it's not so much time under tension. It's more how much of your body mass that you're moving just just on one leg at a time. So if you take, for example, walking up a flight of stairs and you simplified that to a step up, so you just went on to one step. Um, like for most people, that's a pretty easy task because you're driving off the front leg, but you're also using the back leg as well, um, mm -hmm. kind of subconsciously. So it's still very much like a two-footed exercise, and the step is well, in most people's houses, it's like 20, 30 centimetres high. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can increase the height of the step. You can reduce the amount that you're using your back leg in order to overload the exercise and kind of make it um, a little bit more challenging in those ways. And, and then the single leg version is taking away the back leg completely. And so you're stand, standing on a small box or a step. Um, you're bending at the ankle, knee and hip and keeping your heel down. And you're trying to you're trying to get your bum all the way down to your heel so you can go through the full range of movement, um, but without using your free leg whatsoever. Yeah. And as, as you say, like you can either only do that with body mass or very, very light weights, and that's still a sufficient strength yeah. challenge for someone that's quite experienced. So something like, yeah, you know, we're talking like pistol squats here, aren't we? That's yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's probably the next one beyond that, where you're having to keep your free leg like up in the air as well. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, they are hard. Um, but let's let's sort of bring it back to what I call, I mean, you know, most people will call them compound movements. Yes. Um, you know, particularly the technical term. But I, you know, explaining it to some of the people I coach, particularly the the newer people, 
um, to strength training. I call them the foundational exercises, things like squats. Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, once you get to a certain point, doing 20, 30, 40, 50 squats, um, it's that kind of movement I'm thinking, right, you know, we need to be stopping it. You know, once once you've got to doing 15, 20, and you're like, I'm still going, then we really need to be adding weight in, right? Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, yeah, I mean, going back to my original point, I think I think for those that haven't, ever engaged with strength and resistance training before if they if they can do 15 bodyweight squats where they're flexing down and their thighs are breaking parallel to the ground that's pr- it's probably going to be okay for the first few weeks but then as, as you're kind of suggesting like to progress they could they might naturally what think oh, i can go to 20 here i can go to 25 and it becomes a sort of muscular endurance challenge which is then limited by sort of metabolic systems within the yeah. body you're not really overloading and challenging the neuromuscular system, which is what we're trying to do with strength training. And so obviously you need to stay at those lower repetition ranges, but start increasing the intensity of the exercise by, by adding some external load. So that, that could be an elastic resistance band and you can buy those relatively cheaply online. Yeah. I've got one be, here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's usually a, a kind of staple piece of kit in, uh, in, in, in most people's S and C setups um or like dumbbells as, as you say or um or a barbell if you've got access to a, a squat rack and a, a gym type facility and that doesn't need to be doesn't need to be heavy to start off with like you could just add 10 15 20 kilograms but stay as as you were saying within that lower repetition range um of probably 12 repetitions or less to start off with yeah um and that that's yeah that's going to provide a sufficient overload to to your nerves and muscles yeah so i think that's it's certainly from my mind, one of the most common mistakes that the people, and I think this is, again, I always attack runner's world when it comes to strength training because some of the posts I see from runner's <laughs> world where they've got somebody doing all these sort of arm movements and then calling it strength yeah. training just drives me crazy. Is that particularly when you describe, and people might have seen, you know, in, in magazines and things like men's health, women's health, that kind of thing of, you know, the different repetition ranges yep. within the strength world of, you know, low rep is for strength. Uh, and that, you know, we're talking sort of up to six to eight reps. Then we start to go eight to 15 is for hypertrophy. And and then 15 plus is for muscular endurance. Mm. And I think that's where one of the mistakes I've always seen is that people go, well, I'm a runner that's an endurance sport. Therefore I must need muscular endurance. So therefore I must do lots and lots and lots and lots of reps. Yeah. That isn't what we're looking for. No. And we often sort of term that in sports science and strength and conditioning is a bit of a sort of specificity trap, if you like, hmm. that all, all essentially you're trying to do is simulate what's going on in the sport. That's exactly well, the page I've got open in your book, the specificity <laughs> trap. Okay, did I write that in the book? Okay, yes, <laughs> I've been use, using that. Uh, yeah, using that term for quite a while. The, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, to get better at running, in the same way as you get better at football by playing football and tennis by playing tennis, like you need to do more running to get to get good at being a runner. But runners, runners do a lot of that already, so they're already yeah. doing like several times a week, and elite runners up to sort of 10, 12 run runs a week. So they're getting a lot of that stimulus already. And so yeah. if you take a runner out of that environment and you put them yeah, in uh, at their home in the lounge or the garage or you take them to a gym facility, you've got to kind of accept that you're not going to be specific because you're not going to, you're not going to run on the spot or do running in that type of environment. Um, so you've got to think, okay, well, why am I in this environment and doing these exercises and I'm doing it to try, try to challenge my neuromuscular system try to get changes in that because as I was mentioning before we know that that's one of the systems that underpins running economy mm-hmm. and so indirectly we then get a, a a change and a boost in in running economy so you, you need to set set yourself up in a way that allows you to overload that system in the best way and so the exercises that you've already mentioned such as squatting patterns hip hinging patterns stepping and lunging are the best exercises to pick and then we need to we need to be using a repetition range, which is which is fairly intense. And as I said before, probably less than 12 repetitions, um, even for novices. 
and then working down to as low as like three, four, five repetitions once we become quite experienced and skilled at doing the exercise. Yeah. So, so keeping it at, at those lower ranges for sure. And I think sort of just expanding on that rep ranges thing is um, is is what sort of level of intensity are we looking to feel within those rep ranges, you know? Um, you know, because we could say somebody, right, I want you to go and lift five, you know, go and do five squats on a on a set. Um, but if they feel like they could do another 20. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're looking at something called uh, reps in reserve, right? Yeah, yeah. That's um, that, that was probably the best strategy to use, actually. And again, if we were doing this straight out of the textbook and out of the kind of scientific manual, we would go, well, we need to be working at a percentage of one repetition maximum. Mm -hmm. But that's something that I, if, even I won't tend to use with a lot of yeah, runners because, know. yeah, you, you need to, you need to go to the maximum weight they can lift, which yeah. is a little bit a little bit daunting, a little bit scary, particularly even, even, even with experienced lifters, it's quite hard to actually measure exactly what yeah what exactly rep max is. Because it's yeah, precisely that person needs to be so in tune with their, um, you know, with their bodies and understanding like the you know, this. What's Zoom doing? Zoom's just put a thumbs up for some reason. Yeah, I know. I noticed that actually. <laughs> um, I had balloons go across my head the other day. That was quite quite weird. Um, uh, yeah, they, they need to be so in tune with their bodies to know exactly. You know, I really am pushing myself to the limit, but it takes quite a few years for, for, for somebody lifting weights to really understand just how heavy they can actually Absolutely. push. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. And, and, and for distance runners as well, it's, it's kind of a sensation that they never really experience in mm. their sport. And so trying to get them to exert like a max, like a one-off maximal effort with huge intent is, is, is actually really, really difficult because mm. distance running is all about kind of relaxation and trying to be efficient and smooth with your movements, which also kind of helps helps economy. And so, yeah, as you're saying, getting a valid score for a one repetition max is quite difficult with distance runners. And so my preference would be, yeah, es essentially, and it's, it does sound a little bit vague, but we, we need to be kind of working hard within the sets yeah. To the point that when you finish the set and you've done your eight repetitions or your ten repetitions, you probably only could lift you could lift that weight for maybe two or three extra reps. So you've got yeah. a couple of repetitions in reserve. Um, the other strategy that you can use, which I'll often use with with my runners, is just a simple rating of perceived exertion scale. Um, mm -hmm. And so a ten would be that's my repetition max for that, for that weight. Like I couldn't have lifted that weight for another, another repetition. Um, whereas if we're at like a seven or an eight, it's like, okay, that, that was pretty hard. Um, but I had like two or three repetitions in reserve towards the end there. Um, and yeah, that, that seems to kind of hit the right level of intensity um, with, with, uh, with runners when they're, when they're doing these sorts of exercises. Yeah. Yeah, I, I use the uh, the RIR scale, so uh, reps in reserve, and I, I generally give, you know, I want you to lift within one to three um, reps in reserve. So yeah, but hoping that, you know, somebody would go, yeah, I could have done maybe one or two more. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned that sort of like standard sort of textbook repetition continuum that often gets quoted still in magazines, like, yeah, the low repetitions for strength and then hypertrophy and kind of muscular endurance, but certainly with novices, like in the last five years in the research field, like that's very much kind of been debunked a little bit. Mm. But if you, like, if you do a heavy set and you only go to three repetitions and you do a set where you go to 12 repetitions, like the, the strength gains that a novice would actually get would be quite similar mm. as yeah. long as they're working quite close to repetition failure. And um, it actually goes quite high for novices as well. Like you can go as high as sort of 15 and some studies even show 20 reps. Mm. Um, it's typically not what I'd advise because you are getting into the sort of very much sort of, yeah, metabolic demanding repetition ranges there. But it sort of goes to show that to improve maximal strength, you don't need to be down at like one, two, three reps. You can actually be working up at higher repetition ranges. And as long as you're working hard yeah. and you're getting relatively close to failure, then you're going to get some decent gains. Yeah, and I think that's um, I think that's quite an important thing to 
um, sort of talk about there is that metabolic demand piece, you know, the higher the rep range is. And this is this is where I'm always sort of quite careful with my, you know, the people I coach, you know, and, and why I say I want, you know, to be, for you to be working hard in low rep ranges is because, you know, we're constantly managing fatigue. Yes, with, yeah. With, with our running training, you know, it, it is very, you know, we need that fatigue. We need it to, you know, to be able to get the adaptations that we need and for super compensation and all that good stuff. But, um, you know, the reason I want people lifting heavy in low rep ranges is because, you know, we want to um, you know, save you from going into that that metabolic demand and and, and then your strength training becomes more, um, it, it induces more fatigue that we just don't want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you want that metabolic fatigue and that stimulus to the muscles where yeah, you're getting high levels of lactate and other metabolites which cause fatigue, like you might as well go out for a run. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do um yeah, go go and yeah, go and go and do some sort of steep hill training where I don't know, you yeah, you're operating for sort of like 20, 30 seconds at, at a time. Um, like you might as well do a session like that, but going back to what we were saying before, like runners are already doing quite a lot of that. Like those sessions should be in the program somewhere. Um, and so the strength training should be offering something different in terms of its stimulus. Yeah. And that's a really good segue to, um, I, I wanted to sort of ask around, so what, what sort of strength exercises? So we, we've talked about squats and, yeah. and if I had a pound for every time I saw somebody say, squats are useless for runners, you know, we never get into a position as as runners um, that resembles anything like a squat. What would you say to that? Yeah, again, it's the it's this whole kind of specificity issue again. That if we kind of adopt that line of thinking and we think, okay, we're going to use just one leg at a time, we're going to use the same range of movement, which actually for running is quite shallow, um, like the amount of flexion you get to ankle, knee, and hip. Um, we're not going to use any weight because you don't carry any weights when you're running. Like you just end up like if you keep following that kind of same train of thought, you end up back with running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so again, you need you need to pick the exercises that are still similar in terms of biomechanics, but they're not necessarily identical. That are overloading the movement patterns, the muscle groups, which um, uh, which are happening in in, in the sport itself. Um, and keeping in mind we are we're trying to overload the, the neuromuscular system as much as possible it would make sense to put a runner back on two feet because you can obviously lift more load mm. and you can get a higher activation in the neuromuscular system by lifting that load um it's not to say that unilateral single leg exercises aren't still important um, because there's other benefits of those but i would definitely have as, as staple parts of the program some sort of squatting pattern which is usually going to be a, a back squat or a front squat. Um, yeah, once an athlete's kind of competent at those skills and what we call like a hip hinging exercise where we're trying to get some specific load through the gluteal and, and the hamstring muscles. So that's exercises such as an RDL, um, a glute bridge is, is kind of an easier version, a hip thrust or a deadlift from the ground. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, if if one or both of those exercises are in a program, you've already got sort of two kind of big rocks, if you like, yeah. of, of the S&C program that you can then build some of the unilateral work on top of. Yeah. Um, and then upper body, because, you know, we, we talk about, you know, running is very much about using our legs, but I'm a huge proponent of um, upper body for, for many reasons. Um, I mean, my sort of biggest, I guess, uh, my my biggest spiel around you know why I like people doing things like bench presses and um, and rows and you know first of all a bench press isn't a chest exercise it's it, it's one of the compound movements it actually if you're Absolutely, doing a bench yeah. press properly it comes right from the feet all the way through uh, the legs through the course especially and um, you know the chest the shoulders it, it really engages so many different parts and um, and then also I'm very much of the belief that. Um, being strong is about being a better athlete, overall athlete. So why wouldn't you have, you know, you just can't just have a, a strong lower body because if you've got a weak upper body, it's not going to support the demands of, um, particularly in the ultra marathon world. I, I actually found that when I really properly adopted um, upper body training, the, the, the sort of the cramps that I would get from that, you know, that running action with your arms and I'm, 
you know, for anybody listening, you can't see, but I'm doing a running action with my arms here. I used to get really achy biceps from having my arms in that position for so long. I don't get that anymore. Yeah. I used to get that at the end of 800 meter races as well. So kind of the other other end of the scale that I used to kind of feel like it was almost limiting my performance before mm. I started doing any strength training. So yeah, I found it helped, but um, you know, I, I completely agree with everything that you've just said and you kind of summarized it quite nicely that if we're, if we're developing strength in the lower limb, then it would make complete sense to be an all round athlete and develop a little bit of strength in the upper limb. And particularly if we're, if we're able to run faster, so either sprint faster or run up a hill a little bit harder in a kind of ultra endurance race, like you, you'll be getting increased rotations through the trunk as a result of the additional force that you're developing through the ground. And part of what will kind of counteract and control that is additional strength in the trunk and the upper body. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's probably, it's, it's important for a number of reasons. It's not to say I tend not to prescribe sort of whole upper body sessions for runners. Like this is a no, no, a chest and triceps day or a back. It's no, not no. like a bodybuilding type um, program design, but like having one or two exercises in the program, which are specifically using upper body musculature um, and you're still able to control the trunk and get some stiffness and force through the lower limb as well would, would make a lot of sense. Um and so some of the upper body exercise, so, sorry, some of the the lower body exercises that we've already spoken about. So, so things like RDLs and deadlifts, and even squats. Like you'd be surprised how much upper body involvement there is with mm-hmm. those, just to control the, well, the yeah. path of yeah the path of barbells and dumbbells. Just the uh, same as I I said, uh, you know, for me, bench press is not a chest exercise. Squats mm-hmm. are not a leg exercise. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's so, so much more body. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if if you're doing these exercises correctly and with a decent level of competence, you should kind of feel quite a lot of activation, particularly through the trunk and yeah. and, uh, and and through the upper body as well. Um, and so, yeah, very much whole body training. Yeah. I did, I, I can't remember if I saw or maybe I heard it on a on another podcast. Um, there was something like, and yeah, we can talk about core training actually, because you, know, you see so many, Again, runner's world pumping out the do this seven minute core uh, ab smashing exercise workout um, for your running. And I do like core training, but I do use it in probably smaller doses than um, than some people would have thought. Because, yeah. again, doing so, if you are doing a squat, properly a heavy squat properly and heavy being relative to you as a person you know heavy doesn't mean you have to be lifting 100 kilos 30 you know, 30 kilos could be heavy for you but if you are doing something like that properly and engaging your core properly you're getting a lot of core strength yeah 100%. And, I, and actually somebody said to me um i'm sorry just going back to my point there the the, the stat i saw was you get something like 40 times more benefit from doing a squat in your core than doing you know 20 crunches yes yeah that doesn't surprise me if that, that is an accurate statistic yeah 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 no I, I completely agree with everything that you just mentioned and i mean even when i'm ta- when i'm talking to runners and their coaches like i will tend to use the word kind of core but um a bit more scientifically i, t- I tend to try and avoid it it's just it's one of it's one of those terms which it's just kind of one of these sort of pseudo scientific terms, which isn't, mm. it's not very well defined at all. Um, and if you read 20 different studies that had used the word core, they all define it differently. So nobody's really come up with a proper definition of where the core starts and finishes and what its role is in different movement patterns and skills. Yeah. Cause so you could be, could be talking about the, the pecs, the, the lats. Yeah, the, absolutely. The kind of, yeah. All of this is core, isn't it? Hip flexors. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, and some studies will define it as any muscle which attaches to the spine. So that goes all the way up to your neck. Yeah. And also any muscles which control the pelvic position, which goes also that includes your hamstrings, which also cross the knee. And so using that definition, it's every muscle from your neck to your knee, which is almost your entire body. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't make any sense. Whereas there's other definitions, which a bit like a kind of, you think about an apple core, like it's the, it's right in the center of the apple like people will define it as like your transverse abdominus and the pelvic floor muscles, which are sort of deep within the abdomen. 
and you can't kind of um, you can't kind of see. And that sort of almost makes a bit more sense because that sort of is kind of core within your body. But you, it wouldn't make any sense to isolate those muscles by themselves and train them independently unless you've got a specific dysfunction um, or you're recovering from sort of major abdominal surgery. Um, mm-hmm. Like for, for a relatively healthy runner or, particular, or any runners that have experienced lower limb injuries, there, w- there isn't any real strong rationale for isolating muscles in that sort of way. Um, and as you mentioned before, there is there is fairly good evidence that by doing like multi joint compound lifts, particularly that are loaded, will activate a lot of the muscles through the trunk, which people often refer to as the core, in in a much more effective way yeah. in trying to isolate them individually with either kind of sit ups or you sort of traditional core type exercises. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm yeah I'm kind of similar to you that I will tend to have one or two exercises which. I guess a runner might call call like a okay, this is a core or a trunk exercise, but it's it doesn't form the actual program. They're not doing like three core sessions a week, or yeah. a, it's not like a whole core routine. It's just an, a little adjunct to the sort of main program, I guess. Well, let's have a little game quickly. What would those core exercise in inverted commas? What would those core exercises be? Um, those trunk exercises be in your program? And I'll tell you what mine are. Yeah, so I, I tend to favour exercises which um demand a little bit more hip flexion and anterior control because a lot of the the big compound movements that we do so your squats your deadlifts your step ups your lunges like there's a little bit of preferential recruit recruitment through posterior trunk mm-hmm. um so the anterior is involved a little bit but it's not really overloaded massively so i'll tend to do things like heel taps which is a variation of like a leg raise which is quite demanding for for hip flexors as well. Um, Different plank positions and kind of rollouts are quite good for both anterior and and lateral trunk. And also anything where we're we're sort of stiffening and having to control rotational forces. So it's an exercise called a a, a pal-off press and various different chops chops and lifts with cables or bands. Yeah. Cool. So it's the same as yours? (laughs) I, I... So yes, Paloff Press is one that um, has found its way into many of my runners' uh, plans. Um, usually banded. I quite like banded ones. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice heavy bands. Um, just finally gets more activation that way. Um, you, know, you, you find people kind of shaking as they're moving yeah. the, the band back and forth, which really forces them to, you know, to control uh, control the core. Um, planks, yes. I, I have uh, a various different array of planks that i use like dynamic uh planks star planks uh even doing things like putting a band around your legs um and doing a side plank and then lifting the leg Absolutely, with the band yeah. around yeah. it um yeah. stuff like that um and then bird dogs and dead bugs yes Probably. yeah i forgot about yeah bird dogs or super banners some people call them yeah, um, you would yeah, not no, find they're... crunches in my because uh, no. you unless you want your, your abs to look nice yeah exactly yeah yeah you get some runners like to do them for aesthetic purposes which is obviously completely fine but it's yeah. it's again when it's um it's sort of it develops into the program um mm-hmm. like it's the kind of main aspect of the program rather than a sort of little bolt on yeah yeah good okay we're, we're I, I, uh, glad i'm doing it right that's good <laughs> yeah we're certainly on the same page there by the sounds of it <laughs> yeah um so before we start to wrap up, there was a, there was a, I think this is quite a, um, you know, we've talked about the benefits and yeah, we want people doing strength training. We, we, you know, we know what the benefits are. Um, under what circumstances would you say for a runner not to do strength training? If any. Very, very rarely. <laughs> and to be honest, I, somebody like me would be a good example of, I've got to be careful what I say here because uh, I, I still I still do strength training, but some somebody like myself. So you listeners heard a little bit about my background at the start, but yeah, when when I became a rower, I put on quite a lot of muscle mass because that sort of helps rowing quite a bit. Yeah, and I've kind of always kept in touch with my strength training. It's something that's fair, been really consistent in my own training for I don't know, I guess the last twenty years or so. Um, and every, every time I sort of take running a little bit more seriously and I'm like, okay, I want to get back down to 
I don't know, 18 minutes for a park run or run a sub 40 minute 10 K. Like I just basically need to do more running. Um, like I need to go from running three times a week to probably running five times a week and try to get my mileage, I don't know, over 30 miles a week, which isn't a great deal for, um, uh, compared to, to some well-trained runners. Um, but that if that's at the expense of strength training for somebody like me, it probably makes sense because I've got quite a busy lifestyle, obviously with, with family and work and so on. And so sacrificing a strength training session a week to do an extra run because my strength's already fairly decent, I guess, um, would, would probably make sense. Um, there's probably not very many other situations where completely excluding strength training for a runner would make sense. Um, I, I guess it's just those that, that they want to get better at running and that's the priority. They haven't got very much time in, in their lives and they may be only running like two or three times a week. Yeah. So it's like a really, really low volume program. Like if, if someone like me came in and said, Oh, you need to add three strength training sessions a week. So the strength, the strength training is outweighing the running training. Like that wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. Like for, for some people that are uninjured and haven't had many injuries in the past and they're on very low volumes of running, like it would make sense to prioritize increasing running volume first and then try to maybe add in some short strength training sessions yeah. um, on top of that. Um, so yeah, either somebody like me <laughs> or, um, or that type of scenario. Um, but I think for, Probably ninety five percent of runners, it's probably important to be doing some form of S and C. Yeah, yeah. There is uh, that's exactly the answer I was hoping you'd give. Um, and and pretty much, I'm of the same opinion. I have one person I coach that I'm like, look, he he has three days a week where he can run his job, yeah. and family life, and everything. That is all he uh, allows him, and he does. You know, he does hundred. He's just done one hundred and forty five mile um ultra marathon wow that's if we, another level <laughs> yeah and, and and if we dropped one of those running days down to make way for a strength training session i'm not sure he would have had enough volume to be able to have the fitness to be able to complete um a race yes. of that. so yeah, yeah yeah i think i think for me three days uh three three running sessions a week is kind of the cutoff i wouldn't replace yeah. one of those However, if it was a case of, well, do we want you to do another run? I mean, it depends on what the person's goal is, but um, if it was, do we give you another run or give you a strength session? I would usually say three runs plus a strength session or four plus one or four plus two, five plus, yes. plus yeah, two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in some cases, it's kind of one a week, which I, I do have a few people that do one a week, but one is a lot better than none. Yeah, it is. And I, I, I guess the way that we've sort of framed strength training all the way through this conversation is around sort of sessions mm. with the assumption that it takes, I don't know, 40 to 60 minutes to get a sort of st meaningful strength session done. Um, but yeah, as you're kind of alluding to a little bit there, like doing something is probably better than nothing. So, so for example, if a runner did three sets of calf raises in the evening, like that's probably going to be quite helpful Mm. preventing Achilles calf type problems. If they do, yeah, some like dead leg step ups or yeah, some, some form of, of glute exercises after a run and they do that two or three times a week and it maybe only takes up 10 or 15 minutes of additional time. Yeah. Like that's probably a good way to start fitting a small amount in rather than saying, I've got to find an extra two hours in the week to do two strength training sessions. Like, yeah. so you end up kind of micro dosing it in sort of four or five very short units of 10 to 15 minutes rather than um, yet yeah, two sort of brand new sessions that you've got to, got to do. Yeah. I say it all the time. If you're, if your strength session is taking longer than 40 minutes, then you're probably doing too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My, mine are typically about 40 minutes ish and yeah. have to do a reasonable amount of volume just to maintain. So yeah, yeah. I think you're yeah about right there. Yeah. Good. So for anybody, anybody listening who's uh, maybe thought, well, yeah, okay, I get it. Strength training is going to help me be a better runner. What you know, we, we've talked about a few different exercises. What could a, a, a you know, let's say somebody was like, right, I'm going to do one session a week. I'm going to commit to doing one session a week. I don't do any at the moment. I'm going to commit. I've listened to this podcast. I'm definitely going to do it. What exercises? 
would you put in that session? Yeah, and we've kind of all almost got into this level of detail, but not quite. So yeah, it's, it's worth going through sort of what a, a kind of standard session might look like. So I'd, I'd typically, I mean, whatever we haven't spoken about at all is sort of jumping plyometric based exercises, but mm. the majority, and this is maybe for another conversation, but the yes. majority of my programs will have that in at the start. Okay. Not, not a huge volume, um, only about 50 foot contacts. Um, but it's also sort of acts as a bit of a warm up that as well, uh, particularly if they're, they're quite low intensity exercises. So I'd, I'd often get runners doing some pogo jumps for height, some hops, maybe some jumping in different directions, which we know is really good for bone health. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that will often take sort of 10 minutes or so. And then as part of the resistance training, I'd have some sort of squatting movement pattern, um, some sort of hip hinging movement pattern, and then a step and a lunge. So that might look like a goblet squat for beginners or a back squat for, for somebody that's a bit more experienced. Um, a glute bridge as, as a as a hip uh, hinge exercise for, for a novice or something like a deadlift for a ground for somebody more experienced. And then the lunge pattern could be a split squat for a novice or a walk-in lunge for someone more experienced. And the step exercise could be a dead leg step up for a novice and a loaded barbell squat or a single leg squat for somebody that's more advanced. Um, one or two upper body exercises as, as we've already spoken about. And then some supplementary work towards the end. So, for example, some single leg calf raises. Mm-hmm. People have had hamstring issues in the past. I'll, I'll often put in a, a hamstring or a exercise or two. And then if we've got time, <laughs> um, like a trunk exercise. And you can often arrange those supplementary exercises in like a kind of little circuit. So I don't mean a sort of metabolic conditioning circuit, but just you move from one exercise to the next to the next. You don't necessarily get out of breath but it's just a kind of easy way to target different parts of of your body in a a bit more of a time efficient way. Yeah. Yeah. Fairly similar to me. The only difference between, I think you and I there is that um, I don't give plyometric exercises within a, um, in inverted commas, in a strength session. I give people's plyometrics as a, um, as part of their warm up, their stride, those double leg pogo hops and things. That's all part of, you know, pre-run warm-up. So they're getting their, their, their plyometric exercises in um, throughout the week. And hence it kind of, for me, it just helps with that. Oh, well, I don't have time to do strength training. Yeah. You know, if all you've got, if you've got 30, 40 minutes to do strength training, let's do your strength training. And then you can do your plyometric stuff within running warm-ups themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that sounds like a really good way to organize it as well. Um, I've become, I mean, I've always had plyometrics in my programming, but um particularly the way my research has, has gone um, around bone health in, in in athletes and those that have had eating disorders and relative energy deficiency and sports syndrome and so on. Like I'm becoming a bigger and bigger advocate of making sure that I've got some sort of multi-directional work in mm-hmm. as part of warm up. So for young runners, that's important because we know that um, – you know, we know the importance of bone mineral accrual during teenage years, and they've got this kind of window of opportunity. And then for older runners, particularly postmenopausal women, um, and men as well, with reductions in in um, uh, androgenic type hormones as they're aging, like we need a good stimulus to maintain bone, and r- running is not really sufficient mm. um, unless you're doing like fast running down hills. Um, And so, yeah, challenging the bones in different directions is one strategy to try to promote bone health in both younger and and older individuals. So, yeah, um, it's it's kind of one of those areas that, uh, yeah, I'm becoming a bit more adamant that that's really important, whether it's in a warm up before a running session or as part of a strength session doesn't matter as much, but it's should be somewhere in the week, I think. Yeah, good. Um, Richard, we could go on all day. There is so yeah, much to talk about with strength and I, and that, yeah, we were talking about this before we started recording that I'd love to have you on again because we could get into some real detail on um, very specific parts. So it'd be great to have you on again, but today's been awesome just to kind of set the scene a little bit really. And, um, you know, hopefully people that have been listening will just understand a little bit more about why strength training is important. important. Um, I think it's also just really important that we talked about that injury you know, stopping injury, preventing injury piece because it's so overused. And I, 
I always get a little bit worried when I see, you know, coaches say, "Oh, we're going to stop you from getting injured." Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been been really good. Um, thank you so much for for coming on. Yeah, thanks again for the invite. And um, yeah, if listeners have got any specific questions or case studies that um, that are worth discussing, by all means, either I can drop you an email or myself an email. Maybe we can discuss those. Yeah. Well. I always ask my guests, how can we find you? So I'm um, in, in terms of uh, my research and some of my strength and conditioning practice, probably best. They don't call it Twitter anymore, do they? they call it X, X I think. Like yeah. I'm <laughs> the old right. Twitter. So um, my handle on that is at rich underscore Blagrove, um, spot B-L-A-G-R-O-V-E. Um, and yeah, I'm on facebook and instagram but I, I tend to use that a bit more for sort of like family friends stuff and people yeah. will be yeah it's not particularly interesting for most um and then yeah if people wanted to drop me an email my work email address is r.c.blagrove and then at elbro which is l-b-o-r-o dot a-c dot uk yep cool i'll copy those into the uh into the show notes um and if anybody wants to read it because it is a really interesting um but both from a, a scientific point of view but also there's just you know if, if science isn't your thing you, you know your book just really helps anybody of any level really kind of understand you know what's going to help me with my running and uh it is called strength and conditioning for endurance running yeah thanks for thanks for that plug i really appreciate it <laughs> no, no worries at all rich it's been amazing having you on thank you so much and um i look forward to speaking to you again great thanks very much nick